Europe is at the forefront of demographic research and it's high time for Europe to recognize our outstanding scientists. The award is bound to honor outstanding research in the field of population studies and on demographic changes in Europe. You were selected by a special committee uh, of Population Europe for your excellent research. So congratulations, Dr. Bigak, for your achievements and for this award. Demography is quite unique because in, in demography we know a bit more about the future of, of the populations than we do in other social sciences. So quite a lot of information about the, the future population size and future population structure is already encoded in the age structure of today. So pe most of the people who will be living, uh, to, say in Germany, 20 years uh, from now, are already alive and live here. So that's, that's what gives uh, demography this extra advantage in terms of uh, pre predictability. It's not perfect. Migration is one of the worst predictable elements of the, uh, of the puzzle, but, but still there is uh, quite a bit of uh, mileage here. So we really don't know much beyond the horizon of a few years. And that's, that's because migration is driven by so many factors that themselves are quite unpredictable. So political crisis, uh, Syria, the Arab Spring, or anything similar that, that can happen very suddenly and generate uh, huge waves of, uh, of migrants. And this is, this is something that we, are, we don't, uh, as of now, we don't have good methods to deal with. So, so migration, in the short term, maybe we can approximate the, you know, the range of possible uh, futures of migration somewhat. But in the longer term, we don't have uh, good methods out, out as of yet. Well, the basis of always the uh, population and population size and population structure. But, uh, of course, the, 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 the interesting parts are the drivers of, of demographic change. So, so we can look separately at fertility, mortality and migration and try to either predict one or a combination of those into the future, uh, looking at specific applications. And on the other hand, what we can also do, uh, we can, we can uh, retrospectively reconstruct populations. So this is uh, the area where I work uh, in with respect to demography of armed conflict where you can actually, by reconstructing population backwards, you can try to, to, to estimate the number of, of victims of, uh, of the war. So, you're very much constrained by the data here, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to reconstruct the population as it's really changed during the period of the conflict, and then you're trying to contrast it with a, with a hypothetical scenario of how the population would have likely developed if there had been no conflict. Mm. So the, the, the difference, uh, the, the idea is that the difference can be attributed then to, to excess mortality, to excess migration. This is, uh, this is, this is how it's done. If the data are better, as, as we had uh, for Bosnia, for example, or for Croatia, then, then we can come up with the estimates based on lists of victims, mm. which are far more robust and far more exact. In a nutshell, it's, it's a bit like a computer game, really. It is uh, about building artificial worlds and uh, trying to simulate a population and its behavior by uh, modeling individuals, so agents, uh, in a computer program. And to me, the greatest appeal of this approach is that we can, we can try to build in the, the mechanisms of, of uh, population change into such models. What we've been looking at so far, and, and this, this has been 
actually the, the, the preliminary results are very encouraging, is actually try to model the model, or try to build a statistical model of this, this simulation of this uh, artificial world, if you will. The problem is not so much in how to build such, a, such an environment in terms of programming, because that's, uh, that's pretty easy. It's how to, how to connect it with the real world and how to analyze in a meaningful way what comes out of it. That's, yeah. the, that's the real challenge. Well, to, to, to start with, we, have, we, have, we can have several sources of uncertainty. So there is this inherent uncertainty about the future. We don't know the future because it hasn't happened uh, yet. But then we are using models, so there is uncertainty about what, what model is to be used. Uh, the models have parameters. Again, uncertainty about the parameters. Uncertainty about the process that we are uh, trying to, to predict. Uncertainty about the data. The data have errors. So. Uh, what we have is, is a conglomerate of uncertainties. And the, uh, there are statistical methods that actually offer ways of combining uh, these different uncertainties in a coherent way. And, and especially the methods of, of Bayesian statistics developed in you know, 250 uh, years ago and then rediscovered in the second half of the, of the 20th century. Uh, this is an approach that, that uh, in my view, and it's, I'm, a, I'm a very committed Bayesian here, uh, it, in my view they offer uh, the best uh, possible way uh, to combine different uncertainty in a, in a coherent way. Well, we can we can flip this uh, question, so we can we can see uncertainty not as a not as a lack of information, but as additional information. So this is this is uh, something that comes from from the statistical theory that actually uncertainty is information. So what we know we know that if we are trying to predict a point, we will miss. But uh, equally, if we are trying to predict uh, the whole range or the whole, you know, we would call it technically distribution, uh, then we can allow the decision makers to look at this whole distribution, so whole range of possibilities, and look at the situation they are in and think whether, from their point of view, it makes more sense, for example, to underpredict a bit or to overpredict a bit, because in, in that way they, they are hedging themselves against the risks that are very specific to the to the situations that they are in. So, so our current thinking is that instead of trying to do the impossible, so instead of trying to, to predict uh, in a strict sense what will happen, uh, we can actually offer advice, and then the, the decision makers can take this advice and do whatever is best for them in their particular situation. On the one hand, uh, demographic forecasts are one of the key products of demography. So, you know, that's, that's what we are renowned for as a, as a discipline. But on the other hand, the, we need to, I think as, a, as, a, as a academic demographers, we need to do more in order to to uh, help decision makers fine tune the decisions based on, based on, on forecasts or uh, predictions. There are some, some decisions that are made with the future in mind and the, 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 the demographic forecasts are a tool to, to, to help make, make these decisions. The decisions about infrastructure made today will affect the outcomes a few years down the line. So we really need to engage more in the, in the dialogue and be more outgoing with it.